Sometimes magic cards are bad. I mean like really bad. So you put them away and never see them again, but sometimes they become really good. Did you know that Splinter Twin spikes every band season? Number five already blew my mind. I saw that happening, the whole process, and it is absolutely crazy. So we're talking- So you were convinced it was a bad card and then- I was convinced it was a medium, very niche card, but when I saw it unfold, it was completely busted. We're talking about Second Sunrise, because one white white, it says every permanent card that was put into any graveyard this turn is put back onto the battlefield. It's an instant, so that means when you sacrifice your fetch land to get a land, you get that back. When you sacrifice one of your eggs or artifacts to draw a card and get a minor bonus, you get those backs. If you sacrifice your Lotus, which in modern you had Lotus Bloom, but it's effectively a black Lotus once in the play, you get three mana. And then you do that over and over and over and over. The deck is called Eggs because you play a lot of one mana artifact that you can sacrifice for a card and some very minor bonus, usually mana. The deck even won a Pro Tour. I, I love these kinds of stories because yeah. uh, obviously testing for these huge tournaments, you want to keep your deck a secret. So it's like this big reveal all at once when everyone in the world tr suddenly understands how powerful this is that was kept a secret beforehand. Was it developed by Stanislav Sivka himself? Yeah, I think he was the only one playing it. It is a difficult deck and it's also kind of a metagame call because well, people didn't have much of graveyard removal. Oh, the deck became significantly worse after people prepared for it. There's enough ways to interact with a graveyard deck, something that relies on one single spell to like have, an, have a huge impact. And fun thing is that one is one of the rare cards that was banned not for power, but for being boring. Well, not necessarily that, but it was that the mirror was atrocious. The way it was timing out people because they played the mirror was so inconceivable that they said like, it, it was just destructive to turn them and play. That's how powerful it was. So yeah, this is how Second Sunrise was a bug rare for a few cents for one of the modern defining cards for at least a period of time. It's on the ban list now. It is. Our next card is Mikosynth Lattice. Now, Mikosynth Lattice is basically a large artifact that does nothing. Yeah, it is, that's it. There's a bunch of text on it. Go ahead, pause the video, read it through. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't do anything. <laughs> it really does not. What it basically says is, all stuff is artifacts. It's, like Yeah, and colorless. Like, and colors, colors don't matter. Like. Look, this set is all about like colorlessness and artifacts, and this card is here to prove a point, but it really didn't have any of yeah, it. It was more of a story building card than it was anything yeah. else, because it was just, oh, this is the artifact set, let's just make a card that makes the whole world of Mirrodin artifacts. If you read the card, your uh, brain immediately goes to artifact mode, and of course, we're on an artifact plane. Very flavorful card, certainly great, but didn't do anything for like 15 years. And then. War of the Spark. We're in the area of Planeswalkers with crazy abilities. And War of the Spra Spark brought with it a four mana Karn with one of the most iconic lines of text if you play Modern or Pioneer. Activated abilities of artifacts your opponent's control can't be activated. If you have both Karn and the Lattice on the board, your opponent cannot generate mana using their lands because they've become artifacts and that your opponent can't activate abilities of artifacts. Even better, if both players have a Karn somehow and a Lattice is on the board, nobody can generate mana with <laughs> lands. It's not a great experience. Yeah, there was this fun moment where sometimes you couldn't play this because you're dying to your decking when your <laughs> opponent also had Karn and a bridge. It's, no, in, in line with all the other Planeswalkers off that set, uh, I think Watsi and the player base discovered that remembering both aesthetic line of text and multiple activated abilities and the combat interactions was too difficult for players to figure out, especially when they weren't used to it. Yeah. So by now we've kind of stuck with the permanent effect on enchantments and artifacts and maybe a creature, but Planeswalkers do remain limited to that plus and minus. And Mycoson Flatus <laughs> is now banned in modern. Normally this list is cards that become good because of other cards. But this card became good because of thinking about it. Ah, people so it were, was always good. It was always good, but people were too afraid or didn't know how to use it. And eventually over time, it was very, very long ago, where people didn't have internet even, where people had to figure out what that card is. And if I tell you, what does demonic consultation do? You would probably go like, maybe you heard about it? Is that the, you name something and you reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal the name card? 
Very close. Actually, you name a card, you exile the top six cards of your library, and then you reveal cards until you reveal the named card. Uh, so usually it was like a tutor, but if you accidentally exile the cards, you mill yourself. Yes. Say you are like, oh, I really need shock right now. Yeah. And you play it and you name shock, but you exile your two shocks in the top six, then you, you defeat yourself, which is very demonic tacty. Yeah. The problem also was the cards that you were looking for are the good cards. And usually they're only allowed to play once because, well, you want a Black Lotus, right? You want to get your engine going or whatever you want to kill with. So sometimes it was the case that you lost the game, but people didn't figure out and it eventually came to the people who used, well, math and actual game winning percentages that even though you sometimes lose the game, winning the game matters a lot. So let's say in nine out of 10 cases, you win the game, in one case you lose, well, you that's, have to that's accept a card you that case, play. Yeah, right? Yeah. People didn't, people just didn't play the card because like, if I say Black Lotus and it's in the six cards, even though it's majorly unlikely, one out of six times or something, you still should do it and people didn't like that. So people didn't do it. You want to feel in control, right? Like you want to feel like you're still in the game, you want to have a grip on the game you're currently playing until people started doing it because, well, a few said like, you know what, coming from other card games or from probability, you know, maybe we should accept the fact that we lose sometimes and then look for the winning part of it that we sometimes do. And that's what happened. And eventually people realized, oh, I mean, it's an instant tutor for one black mana. So and it was a feel bad when it happened poorly, but your win rate can so up that as Frank Carson said, you should sometimes risk it for the biscuit. For the Schubwaffel. Ah. Risk yeah. it for the Schubwaffel. Yeah. That's famous Frank Carson. So when designing magic cards, Wizards of the Coast usually makes it so that if something is powerful, the more powerful it is, the more you get punished for getting to play it. Uh, this balances the game. Most of the time, the most standard way of doing this is if something's really powerful, it costs more mana. But if they don't want to make it more expensive, sometimes they'll make you pay in other ways. Sometimes you have to discard a card. A very popular way of doing this, one that occasionally hasn't been the easiest way to fix it, is to make you pay life. Life is a resource like your mana. So if you pay life for something like Thoughtseize, it's one mana, look at your opponent's hand, get a card out of it, but you lose two life. And I think that's a fair thing to do. Sometimes you get to play a dual land in the way of a shock land, but you pay two life. But in this case, that dual land helps you because they made a card called Death's Shadow. And this is our number two. It's a one mana 1313. And if that were just it, it would be a little bit too good. So in this case, it's a one mana 1313 that gets minus X minus X when X is your life total. The idea was maybe later in the game, it becomes good. Maybe you're at 11, you get to play one mana 2-2, but later in the game, a one mana 2-2 is not that good. But magic players are a hive mind. Oh, that card was, the, the entire deck is built around like being as aggressive as possible, both with your life total and your opponents, right? Would you, because would you like to tell us how the first few turns of a Death Shadow deck usually go? There's a very famous quote, uh, fetch shock, Thoughtseize, you know, you're at 15. But the quote actually goes, you see a handful of burn spells and then you just concede. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Death Shadow is a really interesting deck and it's a really fun gameplay pattern because you enter in this zone where you're reducing yourself near to a game loss by reducing your life total so much, but you're trying to use that small window to just close the game by attacking with like eight eights. Because the interesting thing is all the pieces were there. There were fetch lands. They were shock lands, those deal you damage, you play them in this deck. Then there was the Phyrexian mana cards, so you could pay two life to look at your opponent's hand and draw a card. Or you could play Terror Battle Rage, which doubles the power of your creatures. So if you're down to, I don't know, eight life, and this is a 5-5, five five, suddenly it hits for 10. All the pieces were together, but I I, I, like the Sam Black crew, I think, got the light bulb over the head moment and decided to put all these cards together. Yeah. And it was in a really powerful deck for a really powerful time. It made the top eight of our best deck ever in modern series. It's kind of a Delver deck where everything costs one and then you're very happy that your deck is so cheap and interactive, which you need to be when you're almost dying. You want a lot of mana to respond. Which is super fun because you feel like you have infinite options and all your decisions matter because all your spells cost one. There's a downside to that. Once yes, again, best deck ever options. series. <laughs> <laughs> in uh, in another fun gameplay pattern, played a Chalice of the Void on one and locked out Yemen from playing cards. Let's rewatch that moment. I will tap two of my lands mm. and we'll cast a chalice of the void for one okay so that means now everything that costs one will become oh that makes my tassiger a bit worse <laughs> yeah but i'll activate the static caster to deal the final damage oh um i have bad news i will use my adrazi displacer <laughs> to blink the drown awful he knew so it comes into play <laughs> and i make two tokens yeah sure so right now I would get 18. 
So I blink your destiny. <laughs> Wait, was... <laughs> all right, it gets blinked. Yes, it's your turn. Uh, I untap with all those creatures. Unfortunately, also your static cast is there. Ooh, I remember I still have this reality <laughs> smasher. Of course, of course. Ah, what a oh, that was beautiful. Why do we keep rewatching me suffer recently? <laughs> <laughs> it was such a powerful deck, and it goes to show how powerful it is that people had to come with creative ways to beat it, because playing on one mana 6-6 six, six will never not be good. Before we get to number one, there were so many cards that we were excited to showcase, but obviously we only have a top five which is not a top eight. It's but a limited space. If you want to see more of the really cool stories about cards being bad, but then being really good for some reason, and then probably getting banned, let's be honest, because <laughs> they weren't too good, then you can check the link in the inside article on Card Market down below and read about all those fun cards. But now let's get to number one. It is all players' favorite Lantern of Inside. All which players' favorite is a bit of a stretch. 50% of the players' favorite, the one who has the Lantern and of Inside. Yeah, deck. Exactly. Funnily enough, we also have a snippet of Jamin. Oh, yeah, it's a really old one. Let's watch it right now. Mm, another Lantern of Inside. Okay. That works? That works. And now it's your turn. I feel like I'm in a very bad spot, Tuffle. Can you believe it? Yeah, why not? We'll we'll throw another bone crusher behind it. Yes. I'll go down to twelve. You're at twelve. You're at three. Yeah. You know what? It's your turn. Wow, graceful. <laughs> uh this one goes to one, and mm -hmm. then I'll draw this one. And then I'm dead. Yeah. Good games. Thank you. <laughs> I never wasn't get that fun. Yeah, it wasn't. Extremely that fun. fun. What does Landon of Insight do? Well, your artifact actually doesn't do much. Just That's much, really. Eh? If you show this card to someone and go, this card want a Pro Tour? The person would probably throw away the card. Yeah. No. They I would mean, spit in your face. What is the reason? You play with your card reveal, but if you don't like the card, you can shuffle your library. Yay, I shuffled my library. But I mean, the important step comes in once you read multiple cards, because Lantern of Insight is just both players play with the top card of their library revealed, and then yes, you get to shuffle something, whatever. Uh, but you combine it with like Codex Shredder and uh, the bell, the Ghoul Caller's bell that mills players, and suddenly you've got a really potent lock engine where you can control what your opponent draws because your opponent plays revealed. You don't like the next card they draw? Well, you just mill it away. It's also on the other side, you feel always like this technically of minor percent chance that we draw all of those good cards in a row, but realistically, you're just... That's what makes the play pattern so annoying, yeah. because normally, if they, you're locked out, you're like, I have to concede here, I'm not gonna win this game, but there's always a chance that you yeah. still win the game, so you have to play through this really slow game. Yes. The cool part about the story is there was this person, Zach Elsick, who in the forum said like, friends, I've been looking at Lantern of Inside, and I think you can build a deck that's actually good. And you know, the internet did internet things. <laughs> <laughs> nope. I mean, of, of course, it, it, and honestly, uh, it's usually correct, right? It's, if someone comes along and is like, right. this card's so good. Mm. But the determination was insane, right? Because like, no, no, I built this deck. Obviously, the deck was crap because, well, it was the first draft and even over many things. Once you're alone with an idea, making an idea better is really hard because you don't have a hive mind, you have yourself. Yeah. And you can play a tournament at a time but then it's really hard to suggest so. But eventually his determination and his arguing skills, I guess, got more people to try it. And then, well, it ended up winning a Pro Tour many years after. And, and we're mean, talking about like and, eight years after. And, and I mean, by now it's an established like archetype. If you tell people like, oh yeah, Lantern of Insight. Yeah, even to this day, there's a, a small percentage of people, but there's still people that very adamantly hold on to this play pattern and ask to see that deck all the time. There's very beloved by a small community yeah, and there are many people who don't like to play against it. For example, Jamin. When we were not oh, we can show that moment right now. <laughs> You're at three. Yeah. You know what? It's your turn. Wow, graceful. <laughs> then I'm dead. Yeah. Good games. Thank you. <laughs> oh, that was beautiful. And that's basically the story of turning a card that didn't do anything into a proto winning card. And we leave you with more impressions of this, as you can see, Jamin. No. A montage of no. Jamin. Yeah. We oh. looked at it twice already. <laughs> you just watch it during the credits. Please enjoy. At this moment, I would like to inflict myself my first board encounter. I'll, I'll take my second board encounter. From here on, it's just basically cruising to victory. Be before I even take my draw, I'll take my third board encounter, because <laughs> then you don't know what I'm drawing. <laughs> Could be surprising. All right, next game, next game.